Okay. So with that, let's start uh, uh, talking about the today's topic that is juggling JavaScript. So uh, typically, like we have been uh, hearing a lot of stuff lately about uh, JavaScript is uh, going places, JavaScript is here, JavaScript is also used in uh, Node.js on the server side everywhere. So uh, today's top, uh, topic is mainly talking about how a browser handles your JavaScript. And that's where uh, the browser backstage come into picture. So where we'll be talking about uh, the various things that browser does for your, your JavaScript to run on it efficiently. So uh, as, as Arvin already mentioned about uh, me, I just kind of uh, mentioned, I'll go very briefly here. So I've been building the browsers for the almost last 20 years. Uh, so been the reviewer and committer actively on the Chromium project. Uh, I started my career on open sourcing uh, on the browsers. I mean, like building the browsers, I have been doing it since like 2004, but now for, to officially contributed to uh, like a, a real open source project. I started that work sometime back in 2010 while I was at Nokia. And then uh, using the, uh, various uh, industries, I have ac built across uh, I mean, they build the browsers across a range of mobile, automotive, desktops, and uh, including IoT and uh, XR devices. So uh, currently, I'm building Arc at the browser company. So prior to that, I worked at IBM, Nokia, Samsung, and uh, Vistron Corporation, where I was uh, working mainly on the automotive side. Uh, I'm quite active on uh, Twitter. So this is my Twitter handle, if you would like to follow along. And uh, yeah. So. Let's see what is JavaScript. So actually, I'm just kidding because uh, I, I know that uh, everybody knows about JavaScript and uh, we are here to know about what really happens behind the uh, JavaScript inside the browser. So, uh, but nonetheless, let me just give you a, a brief history about JavaScript. In 1995, it was built at the Netscape Communications. So uh, Brennan Eich uh, created the scripting language for the web. Initially, it was called as Mocha, but then uh, eventually it got renamed to LiveScript. In 1996, uh, like when I, Netscape partnered with Sun Microsystem, uh, so Sun, uh, uh, if you recall, has been pioneer in uh, building Java. And uh, because they partnered with Netscape, they wanted something similar sounding name. Uh, so they renamed it to JavaScript. So it, hence the name came from, uh, from Mocha to LiveScript to JavaScript. So, uh, but yeah, as, as I said, uh, except the name, there are no other similarities in Java and JavaScript. So uh, in 1997, uh, European Com Computer Manufacturer Association, that is ECMA shortly, I mean, as a short form, has uh, been formed and that's official JavaScript standard. So uh, when I say JavaScript standard, this is, this is the governing body which actually uh, drives what gets into a standard JavaScript library and what kind of uh, things that you can do with it. So uh, the, the things that you see in, in the browsers or the, the, the things that you see in the node, they may not be part of the standard JavaScript library. For example, when you say document.query selector in, inside a browser, so that's not a JavaScript standard defined by ECMAScript. That is basically uh, you have these browser bindings written on top, I mean, provided within the JavaScript. Uh, and then these are part of the, the W3C API specifications. So similarly, Node has provided various uh, uh, APIs which are non-standard. Uh, I mean, when I say non-standard, they're not part of the ECMAScript. So um, just a, a, a honorable mention over here is for the jQuery in 2006. I think jQuery uh, put forward the, uh, the revolution around the web and using JavaScript. Uh, so they came up with a very nice concepts about how to use uh, query selectors, how to use uh, some of those uh, nice uh, looking CSS uh, um, CSS declarations. So with, with all that thing in 2009 is when Node.js arrived and it changed the whole, uh, whole uh, arena about how JavaScript can be also used on the server side. So, and 2011 is when TypeScript was eventually released and TypeScript paved the, pave, uh, I mean, pave the ways uh, for TypeScript safe uh, scripting. Although uh, I must say that browsers will never understand anything uh, apart from JavaScript, but they would just uh, always understand the JavaScript over here. So with that, uh, how is it processed within, within the browser or even for that matter, Node? 
So this is the JavaScript journey. It could be uh, loaded from your local file system. It could be also uh, coming in from the cloud. And uh, browser and the node, they have uh, a, a JavaScript engine which is embedded within them. And that actually takes care of executing your JavaScript. So now I think with this, we can, we can go back home saying like, okay, we are done. And then uh, JavaScript journey just got uh, over there. And then I, we really don't care about what really happens. We just deliver it to browser or the node. And then uh, like these two uh, giants, they take care of everything. Not only that, uh, I mean, not, not there. So this is what really happens within the JavaScript engine. So uh, as you can see that uh, it has various components called uh, parser, abstract syntax tree, interpreter, bytecode, the just-in-time compiler, and which can uh, convert the entire code into a machine code. So all of these things uh, I will be covering in, in detail. So feel free to pause me at any point of time. And uh, just to give a, a disclaimer, this would be giving, I'll be giving more of an overview of each one of these things. And uh, each one of these uh, box that you see over here has its own uh, separate talk for, it can go for, for a day. So, uh, I mean, I, I'll be just giving a very brief overview on these ones. So what is a parser? And uh, just to kind of give you gist of how uh, the next few slides will look like. So on, on, on this slide at the uh, bottom left, you would see like what component we are talking about and how it fits into the overall scheme of the JavaScript engine. And uh, then you will see uh, the progression of uh, the topics around it. So uh, let's talk about the parser. So what is a parser? So uh, whenever you see you write a JavaScript, you write it in uh, in JavaScript, of course. And then uh, there are few of this uh, uh, like name mangling that happens on this one. But at the end of the day, still uh, it's a it's a um, stream of text that will be delivered to the browsers. Uh, but then browsers would convert these uh, input JavaScript source to a, a something called as an ab abstract syntax tree. So this, we will be talking about this in detail later. Uh, so, but then JavaScript parsing is a major uh, page, page load bottleneck. So any browser vendors, uh, they would be uh, kind of worried about the page load performance because JavaScript loading as well as the parsing, both are blocking, unless you have specified certain directives on your script tags. Uh, fewer, I mean, some of the recent studies have talked about how real world pages spend about 15 to 20% of their time on JavaScript parsing. Uh, whereas on the mobile web, even sp could spend, I mean, these uh, time that they spent on parsing JavaScript could go up to 3.5 seconds, so which is huge. Uh, so uh, there are a few engines uh, like who are building the JavaScript engine. So uh, namely V8, there are others like uh, SpiderMonkey. Uh, earlier, my, Microsoft used to have Chakra. So, and then uh, WebKit has something called JavaScript Core. So all of these JavaScript engines are available and each one of them, they serve their uh, browsers and Kind of uh, the the V8 kind of engines, they are uh, uh, built as an uh, as a library that can be embedded uh, into into anything like Node.js or the browser. So I'll be mainly talking about the V8 implementations uh, about this parser. Uh, but then, uh, as I said, these topics can go uh, in depth for other browsers as well. So uh, the V8 actually implements two modes of parsing: eager parsing and lazy parsing. Uh, so don't worry about it if you don't uh, uh, like remember all these terms. I'll be giving few of the examples here. So what is eager parsing? So eager parsing, as the name suggests, uh, it parses the JavaScript code as soon as it sees it, as soon as it is loaded. So uh, and then uh, once it has parsed it, it will be available for execution immediately. Okay. And uh, it can improve the page uh, performance of the page by reducing the parsing time. But however, it can increase the memory usage by the browser. So you might ask, or you might wonder, what is uh, eager parsing has to do with how do I write my JavaScript code? So there are a few examples that I have given uh, here uh, in the code snippet, um, where uh, you will have these top level expressions, like const a equal to 100, or IIFE, that is the immediately invoked function expressions. 
uh, where you have this function and then you wrap it within the, uh, the braces and then you also make a function call to this one. So all of these things are called as uh, uh, top level expressions or IIFE, IFE for short. And these are all parsed immediately uh, by the JavaScript engine as soon as it sees it. So, but then uh, you might also start uh, looking at what is lazy parsing. So lazy parsing as it names suggests again, uh, it defers the parsing until it is needed. Uh, often used in asynchronous JavaScript and background tasks. Uh, it kind of results in a reduced uh, memory usage by the browser, but it may cause uh, garbage collection pauses. So uh, here I have given us just a very small example called a function world. So as you can see that the, the author of this code has just defined this function and it's not used anywhere. Uh, so this is where uh, uh, the lazy part parsing will come into picture. And then it would be passed as soon as the function call to world is invoked. So with that, we will move to uh, the abstract syntax tree, like how these, uh, uh, the things that we saw over uh, the previous slides, like uh, the top level expressions, if he's, or even the, the lazy expressions, like just a function declaration are actually handled by uh, the browser by creating an abstract syntax tree. So uh, it's not really a browser. Let me let me be correct over there. So it is basically the JavaScript engine, which is uh, uh, responsible for uh, parsing this and then kind of translating into an abstract syntax tree. So to understand this better, I have actually uh, a URL that we will just visit quickly. So let me know if you can see this. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, so uh, on, on my right hand, on my left hand side, you will see uh, uh, the same code that we have been looking at it. And uh, there are a few expressions over here. Uh, and then on your right, you would see, uh, on your right hand side, you will see how the abstract syntax tree is generated from this one. So uh, as you can see, the first line, as soon as you start hovering on each one of these uh, declarations over here, or I would say the, the node in this tree, it will correspond back to what it is showing from your source here. Okay, so uh, the first is obviously the variable declaration. So when I start expanding this one, uh, you will see that it is it is part of a declaration. What is the kind of it? It's a const. So you can see that it will uh, it will go on. Like what's the identifier? The identifier name is a, uh, and it has an initializer. It is initialized with a literal. Literal value is hundred. Uh, so this is how you will see the whole entire uh, abstract syntax tree, which we could, we can understand this. Okay, so likewise, it can go for these ones. For expression statements also, you can see that this is an express, uh, call expression, uh, who is the callee over here? So the object is console, the name is the console, then the property is log. So you can see all of these details parsed in a, in a tree form uh, using this one. So this is an AST Explorer uh, website, so you can, you can, uh, take a look at this one uh, i have shared these uh, uh, like code snippets directly for understanding uh, i made these per i made these uh, code examples uh, quite uh, like simple just to understand these ones but uh, you are uh, you can play around with like complex functions the fees and all those things and like you see how the a st is generated for this so yeah feel free to use that one so Coming back to this one, so now we saw that a tree is getting formed here, right? I mean, I just use this this tree here just for a representation. So now, in order to execute this, this code needs to, I mean, this tree needs to be translated in some form of uh, interpretation that uh, the JavaScript engine can do, and it will start traversing this tree in in the execution order, and then it would generate something called as a bytecode. So uh, I will also talk about what is a bytecode, but uh, just to briefly, uh, you can install this V8. I mean, this is on, on Mac, but I think you can also use uh, uh, something similar uh, on your other platforms like um, Windows and Linux. Uh, so this is the same example. Again, I have re referred here, uh, ABC and the console lock. And uh, once you install the V8, you get some get something called as a D8, that is basically a debugger shell, and that's the reason it's uh, called as D8. Uh, it has a command line parameter called print bytecode, and you can feed your JavaScript file into it, and then it would 
show you the bytecode that is getting generated for this particular source code here. Okay, so if you're if you're not uh, comfortable installing any new tools, you could use uh, a node your node existing node installation, and then you can just pass this print bytecode and pass the same file to it. But just be aware that a node has a lot of boilerplate code for its process startup, and then you will see a huge bytecode that is getting generated for like these four lines of code. Uh, but eventually, if you if you see the output of these two uh, commands, like D8 and as well as the node, uh, you will see something similar here. Okay, so this is how the bytecode will look like uh, when you use the D8 or uh, node subprint bytecode uh, command line argument. And uh, I have highlighted here uh, this particular uh, like instruction. So this is like a interpreted instruction. So where uh, it is trying to move a lot of these variables into register and then trying to add it with probably a stack. And then uh, this is what we are doing. The variable C is equal to A plus B. So this is what is the operation that is being uh, being done over here. So this is how the uh, the V8's uh, bytecode looks like behind the scenes. And uh, it can go, it can get very complex depending on what you are uh, trying to do over here. So as I was uh, uh, showing you the journey of like, uh, try to understand the AST Explorer, try to understand how the, uh, the I mean, the engine is trying to create a tree out of it. And then once you have understood that, probably this would be much more easier. I know this, might look a little complex, but don't get intimidated by uh, intimidated by that one. So, if, um, yeah. Then uh, now, like we all of us, we have heard about JIT. So, just uh, JIT is basically just in time compilation. Uh, so, what is it basically? So, as you can see, that uh, we have seen so far, the JavaScript uh, uh, source code is. Uh, parsed initially created, I mean, translated into AST, and then uh, a bytecode is generated from this one as uh, as uh, suggested in this diagram as well. And then this bytecode is actually run uh, by your uh, uh, JavaScript engine. But whereas the JIT compilation, uh, although this is a really a, a good way of executing the JavaScript, there is there are certain performance penalties that you pay because uh, this is still an interpretation over here. So uh, Sometimes browser sees that uh, you are uh, executing certain, uh, not the browsers, uh, sometimes your uh, JavaScript engine sees that uh, a specific function block is executing, uh, is getting executed repeatedly. Uh, so in that case, it may decide to uh, translate this per portion of the tree or the interpreted code into something called as a machine code. So machine code is something that will be generated directly for uh, your uh, architecture that uh, on which your uh, uh, program is running. So it could be an Intel based, it could be uh, an ARM based, uh, just like on, on Apple Silicon. So for these uh, machines, machine architectures, so there are specific set of instructions or the opcodes is uh, defined by the by the the CPU vendors. And then uh, the just-in-time compilation actually takes this interpreted code and converts that into an actual machine code. So this is much faster. Uh, this is running natively uh, because this is just like compiling your uh, uh, statically compiled languages like C++ there because C++ source, you uh, compile it into a binary and that binary is nothing but <clears throat> a set of instructions uh, with respect to the machine code, a machine architecture on which uh, it is built for. So with that, uh, the same instructions that we saw here, I will show you that the journey from this one. So C equal to A plus B. This is the actual source code. This is uh, where we saw the, the interpreted uh, uh, instruction. And this is the machine code that is getting generated uh, for, uh, I think this is for the ARM architecture. So I'll, I'll confirm that one, but this is the kind of instruction set that you can see. And this is the entire source code. Like for this A, A B, C, and console.log, this is the overall code that is getting generated. So as you can see from the number of uh, uh, lines over here, uh, this is already pretty concise over here. Uh, so that may not be true. That depends on the code that you are actually building. So don't take that. Uh, every time you do a JIT compilation, you, it will generate a smaller number of instructions. It totally depends on the machine architecture. Uh, it also depends on a certain uh, machine architectures provide 
very compelling opcodes, uh, something called as a SIMD, so single instruction, multiple data. So those kind of things also are taken care by the by the JavaScript engine over here. And then finally, uh, this all gets translated into a machine code, and this is what is actually run. So, yeah, I will again go to a, a website over here just to show you around uh, what really happens uh, when you generate a JavaScript code. The same thing what I covered it in the web, I mean, on the slide, is you can see it on, on this one. So there's a compiler explorer uh, mm -hmm. website where you can actually punch in your JavaScript code and then uh, like you can, you have just uh, select specific uh, compilers over here. There's a tons of compilers uh, available. So, and then you just give uh, a certain commands to it so that it can give you uh, uh, assembly output. So this is basically like, I instructed the compiler to give me uh, the assembly generated code in, in verbose manner. So you can see this one. So uh, having said that, I wouldn't uh, recommend that you always look up to like how the JavaScript will be uh, translated into the machine code during the JIT phase. Uh, that is because, as I said, depending on the machine architecture, depending on the available uh, like instruction sets or available special instruction set, each compiler can can go. I mean, each JIT phase can result into a different code, and then uh, that's the reason. All the JavaScript engines uh, basically uh, would refrain from uh, like JavaScript developers to go into the details of how the machine code is generated. Uh, nonetheless, it's it's really good uh, uh, good technology that you should understand what really happens behind the scenes. But uh, if you are trying to go get into the nitty gritties, probably uh, you should also read uh, various different blogs uh, about each JavaScript engine. So V8 has a nice blog. I have I have a few reference links uh, during this slide, so you can actually refer to those ones. So, yeah, coming back to the performance. So now we talked about all the phases of uh, within the JavaScript engine, and uh, uh, like also I showed you about what is the bytecode, which is nothing but an interpreted code, uh, and the machine code is uh, how uh, JIT. Uh, I mean, it is basically just in time compiled code. Uh, so you might see the performance will of the machine code will be always much faster than the bytecode, but in reality that is subjective, as I said, because uh, the JavaScript engines would uh, do a lot of profiling of the code that is getting executed within the, the JavaScript engine. Uh, so if there are certain hot paths, when I say hot paths, it's, it's uh, getting repeatedly called by uh, your, uh, I, mean, pro, I mean, program author. So in all these cases, uh, the the JavaScript engine will convert that into a machine code, but it is quite subjective and each engine handles it differently. So uh, this is just, again, uh, you need to kind of uh, weigh in the balance, just try to understand what really happens with the performance uh, behind the scenes. So it is subjective. So uh, until this point, we have only talked about uh, what really happens in the JavaScript world and in the JavaScript engine with respect to uh, the JavaScript code that uh, the authors have written. But from this point onwards, I would be going into the browsers, which is basically the main topic of, of this uh, discussion, that uh, how the browser handles the render pipeline and how JavaScript plays a role within that one. But before I go into that one, I just wanted to uh, see if you have any questions or anything that you would like to uh, discuss before we go there. <clears throat> what I, well, look, I mean, you know, I just want to share my experience with my sort of the periphery and my systems experience, uh, where we use a lot of Citrix, we use a lot of browsers. Uh, well, actually, if, well, correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, you're the investment expert, of course, when it comes to browser programming, but you know, typically what happens in the Indian context when it comes to at least um, the treasury systems, and I don't know about the IT, IT, IT part of it is, uh, you know, normally people have a choice of like three or four browsers okay, in case something happens. One, like, like let's say there's a production system. So let's say you have a Mozilla, you have a Firefox, and you have a Google, and you have the Chrome, and you have the Internet Explorer. So three or four. In case something happens, one, they try the next. In case something happens, then they try the other. Okay. Um, the problem, obviously, according to me, is all of these have some kind of memory leaks issues. If I'm if I'm not wrong, right? So I guess you are trying to address that in terms of the new development. Would that be correct? 
So uh, I think that is partly right I mean, and I mean, partly. Before, before, first thing before we go before the, what I said about the choices. I mean, Mozilla is going to have the same problem if you use it for a long time. You know, so what these guys do over here is they give three or four choices. So you just fire up one. If it fails, fire up the other and try. And one of that works at one point in time. Okay, it's some sort of justification. Wouldn't that be correct? I think that uh, probably may not be the. I mean, that's what uh, I have observed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because as I said, uh, uh, the, when the when the browser sees a JavaScript, it can considers that as an insecure context of execution. Because what we are trying to do right. is like we are trying to uh, get an external execution context downloaded within your machine and then trying to execute it. So any browser, okay. for that matter, would treat everything that runs uh, as a JavaScript is an insecure context. Now, because uh, like the, the the point that you raised about the, the memory leaks is a, is a crucial one. And it a lot depends on how the JavaScript developers have actually built that particular uh, that particular application. So I can I can give you one one of the anecdotes uh, without actually naming the product here. So it is basically a video conferencing app, quite quite popular. And then what we were seeing is uh, Wait, which one is that? This... Which one is that? Sorry. No, I would like to uh, not to name that one because. <laughs> Oh, okay, so, okay, but then it's it's, it's 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 quite popular uh, uh, video conferencing app, and it has a feature called uh, picture in picture. So when you're actually uh, trying to move away from that tab, you can actually put that into uh, into picture in picture mode, so that you can you can parallelly uh, attend your call and work with some of your mails or other things. Okay. So what we saw there was uh, the picture in picture implementation for this video video conferencing app uh, was leaking heavily on the video element okay and because okay. every time this application goes into picture in picture and comes back out of it they need to uh, clean up that that the video element that i created should be cleaned up within the browser's context and it was not cleaned up and because what really happens is when uh, you are executing a javascript it definitely need certain resources to be allocated both on the browser side as well as on the render side. So render is basically the process in which uh, your JavaScript runs or your entire website runs. And then there is a uh, there is a kind of uh, controller process called what we call it as the main process where the entire uh, uh, resource consumption or like resource access is controlled by. So that is when we also saw that this memory leak was not only confined within the render, it was also leaking that uh, uh, leak into the main process because uh, for doing these uh, these video composition inside the inside the picture in picture implementation. So they were using the GPU. GPU is used for the hardware acceleration compositing, and then that's when we saw that uh, when you go out of this picture in picture mode back into the normal tab browsing. So it was leaking a lot of memory and it resulted in such a way that our main process started eating a lot of these resources. So uh, I would say this has a ripple effect, what you what you just mentioned. It is a ripple effect depending on like how your developers are uh, uh, building the JavaScript applications. It will have a side impact, uh, side effects on, on the browser engines. So that is the reason uh, I don't know whether you have been following the, uh, the 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 vulnerabilities that are being found in the browsers. They have been kind of exponentially increasing over the years. Uh, that is because uh, the kind of capabilities that the browsers are exhibiting today, uh, they are much more powerful. But at the same time, a lot of these features go unnoticed or they will probably be overlooked. Uh, and then uh, there are these. Uh, uh, loopholes within the JavaScript environment where the attacker can take the help of uh, the the vulnerability and then they can actually uh, find their way around it. So that's where uh, we have seen a lot of these memory leaks. And uh, if you follow the uh, any blogs of any browsers, including Safari, including uh, Chromium, all of these ones, they have their bulletins, security bulletins that they are published. And that's where they mention about how an attacker can actually uh, leverage some of these uh, uh, vulnerabilities, and that's where uh, your your uh, I mean root of the question lies over there. So if you see that some of these uh, like unknown issues are exploited by uh, knowingly or unknowingly, you might result into seeing this one. And uh, changing the browser would just shift the problem for some time, but it will not uh, alleviate right. it completely. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Mm -hmm. 
And then, then typically there's also the issue of, you know, the, the, the whole thing about, you know, the machines improve and the capacity improves, but of course the programs also churn out, you know, like utilize more memory over a period of time. So then, well, I mean, you know, paying the extra premium for, you know, like the extra cost, uh, you know, I've seen a case where a genuine case where like, a student was trying to toy around I and mean, his father bought him like a big big time laptop like a very sophisticated laptop and he installed something very sophisticated on it which looks very sophisticated and it went kaput you know and he mm -hmm. was really frustrated and i don't think it was his mistake right the yeah. problem is the sophisticated program itself like like is is not programmed properly you see and they call it a sophisticated yeah. yeah, I think that's that's a that's a good observation, and I think that goes to any software uh, in in the world. Probably, I think there is no uh, best software that is uh, born yet, right. just yet, because every time you do, there is a, a technology that catches up both in the hardware, both in the software. So some of the primitives right. that you wrote uh, a year ago uh, as to address some of the security vulnerabilities have been kind of uh, compromised in the recent times because of the recent advancements uh, both in the software and both in the hardware and that might uh, cause some of these issues uh, as well and uh, on the other hand side i mean you also brought a great point of uh, uh, a, a beefy systems or a, a great systems with like with a lot of capabilities are also being uh, like built so uh, with when i come to when it comes to the browser specifically so there is one uh, one uh, what do you say policy that chrome or chromium based uh, derivative browsers have adopted is uh, if let's say my system uh, has around 64 gb of ram and then if i start restricting uh, you from creating num more number of tabs or more number of uh, uh, like websites that you can browse. So what's the use of, of like the 64 GB RAM that you have got on your system? So uh, the main priority for the browser engine specifically is about the safe safety and the uh, sandboxing of your uh, uh, like insecure context. Whereas restricting the performance is kind of, uh, I would say it is also a, a paramount of paramount importance. But at the same time, the sandboxing and security is the, is the utmost important uh, thing for the browser. So uh, let's say, for example, if you are if you have opened like uh, uh, prior to uh, Chrome came with a multi-process architecture in 2008. So earlier we had this Internet Explorer with like tab browsing was there. Uh, tab browsing was uh, made popular by Mosaic and then eventually Netscape uh, browser. Uh, and then uh, like IE also adopted that one. But when you had these multiple tabs that you would visit and one of them goes kaput as you said uh, so your entire browser will come down crashing okay so would you want to have that one i mean i i would give you a great browser with the performance uh, uh, as its core but at the same time the experience would be so uh, uh, so miserable that you would want to see that okay i want to use my browser i mean i don't really care whether that particular tab is crashed or not Right. So uh, imagine like right now I'm, I'm taking this call uh, right within the browser. And uh, if some of these websites that I'm going to show you right now goes uh, uh, like I mean, it, it crashes. So it will bring me down from my meeting as well. So which is a uh, totally unde undesired behavior here. Right. Well, the whole point of here is let's say something looks like, you know, like what? Well, a stable one. Well, well, something looks, you know, promises to be let's say of uh, of a certain quality level you know then in that case uh well i mean or or, or let's say something looks looks like a ferrari and well it just pop, behaves like a you know bicycle i mean you know that's 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 disgusting that's what i'm trying to say and there have been very rare cases of that and that can be very frustrating because that human being then invests a lot of money in that you see that Right. Yeah. And it's very disappointing. And I, in this particular case, I don't think it was the kid's mistake. Right. I totally agree. I mean, it, it depends on like how everybody has programmed it. And that's where a lot of these vulnerabilities are also coming in. And thankfully, at least in the browser's case, these are addressed and fixed immediately. And that's the reason you will see a lot more updates coming into your browser. Let it be anything like Safari, Internet Explorer or anything. But that may not be true for for other uh, piece of the software. So I, I, at least I have also used in the uh, in the previous past few of the softwares, 
uh, which have not been updated over the years, not just within the months, like over the years, these have not been updated. So given such a kind of advancements that we are seeing both software and hardware, uh, it's really important for the software or the products that you are guys, I mean, like you are building needs to be also catching up on with the updates, regular updates and maintenance. So I think that's the key. Right. So, um, I mean, I had a go at Zoho, you know, which is a freeware. So Zoho definitely doesn't sound like a replacement. <laughs> like, like, I mean, it's good for like botch ups and all that. But um, botch uh, I think I have to uh, ch chip in here. Hi. Can we move on with the presentation? Yeah, 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 sure. OK, so uh, coming back to the browser render pipeline, so I have given a, a, a wireframe of how a YouTube looks like on your website, on your uh, uh, in, in, in your browser. So uh, in the next slide, you will see uh, me talking about uh, how this rail looks like. So I'll, I'll uh, give a explanation of what is this rail and what it has to do with the rendering. So consider that each rail or the section of the rail over here is a, a time fragment that the browser gets to generate what we call it as a 60 frames per second. Uh, so that means to generate the frames which are smooth for scrolling, uh, smooth for interactions. And that's what you know, every uh, like user desires today. So browser essentially, uh, in order to run this at the 60 frames per second, so you have to divide that uh, like 1000 milliseconds by 60, and then you will just get around 16 milliseconds for each frame to be generated. Okay, so when I each frame, so just take a look at uh, look at this particular uh, side over here. So you can see that browser has started uh, loading the resources for uh, YouTube. So it has uh, allocated or maybe just rendered uh, these uh, squares and the lines over here. But as as the time progresses, it, it downloads a lot more data and then it also uh, starts rendering few of the details within your website. So like there are like two videos have been loaded, but then there are a few still are in progress. Uh, like it gets few more uh, thing over here. And this is where the finally your page is ready for uh, interaction. Okay, I mean, it's ready for consumption here. So this is the journey that the browser goes through. And uh, for, for each frame that is generated, so this is basically a lot of work that the browser does. That means it does a fetching of the resources that uh, the, the website is requesting. Uh, this is the kind of execution that happens within the JavaScript engine, like parse, execute, garbage collection, like there are patterns of other things. And then there is a, a layout and a rendering where actually the layout happens, uh, the style calculation, style application, uh, input handling, as well as the paint. Uh, so all of these uh, phases combined together has uh, got a uh, time of 16.66 milliseconds. So, uh, so this basically is how you will see your website is responsive or not. Uh, and then uh, you will probably, you have seen a jittered experience that I'm not able to scroll past my, my scroll, scroll is stuttering. That is because your JavaScript is kind of interfering with these ones. It is not generating the frames in between. And then you will see jump from here to here. And then that's where you will see um, uh, a janky experience on your scrolls. So now, as you can see in this slide and this slide, there is a only a, a, a variable change here is the 120 FPS. So a uh, few of the current uh, MacBooks and other uh, devices have started coming up with 120 frames per second. So these are at least in the in the Apple world, these are called as ProMotion displays. Uh, they have capability of running the, uh, I mean, generating the frames at uh, 120 frames uh, at the hardware level. So definitely uh, the, the software would like to take the capabilities of your hardware and provide this, but it puts an enormous uh, uh, constraint on it because the time has been half, halved here. I mean, halved here, and it has the same set of execution that it has to do. So this is where uh, uh, like browser comes into picture, and then uh, there are a few techniques that we we actually employ uh, so that the JavaScript execution can can run comfortably and without actually compromising too much on the frame generation here. I am not saying that every browser uh, would generate a frame on, on every uh, like every block over here. That is impossible, but uh, we try to be uh, like as much as the dead, I mean like uh, working on the deadline. And uh, 
there are certain hooks that we provide as from the browser vendor i mean as a browser vendor to the javascript developer so that uh, you can actually take leverage of that one so with this i have a i have a live demo uh, with this one so let me get back to my to the browser so this is simple uh, sample application uh, that I, I wrote here. Can you see it? So it, it has nothing but uh, just a timer. I'll just run this real quickly. So you will see that it runs uh, at real fast. And then uh, you will see this uh, millisecond uh, accuracy here. And it just starts uh, generating this uh, uh, like view over here. Now, just to understand like what really happens behind the scenes uh, for this one. So let us go and inspect the browser. Uh, sorry, within the dev tools. So you can open this dev tools and go to the performance uh, uh, panel here and then ensure that you have selected the screenshots and then hit record. So what browser is doing right now is it is profiling your code that is generating all of these frames and also uh, yeah, I'll just stop it over here. And also it is generating these uh, individual, I will also stop this so that it, will, it is less distracting. And it is also generating these individual frames over here. I'll just zoom this thing a little bit, just so that you can see it here. So as you can see that I can I can go on to hovering these numbers and here is where you can see the, the frames are actually showing you the, the millisecond that we cannot really see when the application is live. So, but then, Browser is seeing these ones, and these are the ones which are actually painted continuously uh, on your screen. Okay, so as as I can start uh, sliding over these ones, you can see the the timers are moving here. So, but then the more interesting part here is uh, I will show you that uh, during this uh, here is where you can give, go for this uh, uh, 16 milliseconds one. Uh, like that's the the time that we each browser has to generate the frame, and here is, you can see that these are nicely aligned right now. Like every 16 milliseconds before that, uh, we are generating a new frame, and it is actually shown onto the screen. So that's the same thing you can also see. Uh, this is 952 milliseconds, and this is 969 milliseconds. Quite quite close for 16 milliseconds here. So this is generating nicely here. But at some of the things, you will see that uh, there was uh, these black frames here. So what really happened here? Okay, so when you start looking at these ones, so this particular frame <coughs> was executing a JavaScript, but then it did not generate the frame that it needed for the next frame here because it kind of elapsed all its time. And then the next frame was not generated, like next two frames are not generated over here. So that's the reason you can see that from 250 to 267, which is almost 16 milliseconds, there is a straight jump to 320. That is because two frames are not generated over here. Okay. So now this is because the way that we have written the code, uh, I'll just quickly show you the, the code that is written behind this. <coughs> so this is the clock HTML. This is uh, the way that it is written is, uh, because we have not clicked on the request animation frame, I'll talk about that one. We use a set timeout, uh, which is like everybody's favorite in JavaScript world. And we call this update clock uh, uh, function. So it does nothing but just uh, uh, like computes the new date time, divides it, and then uh, just changes the, the div here. Okay. So now, because of this, what has really happened, if you go back to the performance here, uh, so you will see these uh, yellow uh, regions over here. These are all JavaScript execution. And you can see that the browser is spending much more time in scripting here rather than doing other, other stuff here. Okay. So in the next example, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, reload the page here, but this time I'm going to use the request animation frame and uh, you will see the difference. And in the process, what I'm going to do is like uh, while this uh, timer is ongoing, like the this uh, timers are changing here. I will just uncheck this so that you will see the same uh, difference within the same profiling that we will take. Okay, so I'm just going to clean this up. I'm going to reload this page and start the recording. So I have started this, and this is where I have the request animation frame exactly. going on. Right. And then, uh, so now at this point, I'm just unchecking this. So now I'm using the set timeout. So still the profiling is going on. So once this is done, so you will see that the profile has been generated. 
And I just want to show you this high level view over here. So these are the two phases. Okay, so this particular phase is when we were all using the request animation frame. Okay, so you can see that there are like much lesser <coughs> uh, yellows, yellows bars over here. But on the other hand side, uh, you will see a lot more yellows here. Okay, um, I, I, I will try to zoom this thing in. You can see here, like they are also quite dense here. Okay, but where are this one is not that dense and it's quite nicely uh, evenly spaced here so <clears throat> what is this this difference here okay so now let us start uh, going into the details of this one here so this is the same <coughs> 16 milliseconds stuff that we had but as you can see that our javascript execution is channeled within this request animation timer that gets fired by the browser <coughs> excuse me So this is where you can see that your uh, function call is, uh, is <coughs> getting executed. So if you can see here, there is animation frame fired, update clock, this is called, but then like how much time it is spending, it's, it's quite less here. And then once this is done, you can see that there is a layout phase, the, then there is a paint phase, and then there is a commit phase. So commit phase is when basically actually you will see it on the screen. So this whole thing is happening within this task block within like less than <coughs> uh, 22 milliseconds here. I mean, like 40 microseconds here. Okay, so this, this entire operation is here. And as I start going towards this portion over here, you will see a stark difference here in terms of how the paint really is triggered. So this GPU is when actually your uh, frame has been picked up for execution, I mean, for painting. So. Here is where you can see that the JavaScript is executed here because we are using set timeout. So, so it took this time uh, to generate the frame, but if you see the actual painting layout and all that phase is uh, uh, like moved apart because we are not working in cohesion with uh, the browser's timeline here. So you will see there is a difference of like when you have generated the frame and when it is actually taken by the browser for painting here, okay? So this is the difference of uh, why uh, using the set timeouts is uh, uh, generally a bad practice within the uh, JavaScript uh, code that is being written because it tends to run at uh, times which are not synchronized with the browser's rendering pipeline. So if your web apps are uh, uh, like, uh, like very visual intensive, so something like this would really help because uh, as you can also see, Within the 16, milli uh, uh, 16 milliseconds time, uh, like no matter how many frames you are going to generate, browser is just going to pick one. Okay, so uh, that is exactly what really happens when you are using the request animation frame that it just generates one frame and then it, it has no other activity happening here. Whereas if you see the same 16 milliseconds uh, time slot, your set timeout has been called multiple times here. Okay. So it doesn't really matter like how many times it is getting called, but uh, the, the final ones only will be picked up by your uh, GPU here. So these two are uh, uh, like wasting of the resources that you have done because these are like uh, generating the frames which nobody is looking at it. So this is this is about uh, the thing that we, we see uh, in the performance profiling here. So very quite simple example uh, with uh, a few of the uh, uh, things that are shown over here. So uh, with that, I think I am done with the with the demo. Any any questions on on this demo so far? Um, right. Yeah, demo was very good. Uh, yeah, help yes. me to appreciate. Uh, so, can, can, what is the alternative to set timeout? Can you uh, just repeat that a little bit? Request animation frame. Request animation frame. Okay. And, and uh, I'll be also talking soon. I mean, not in this uh, context, but uh, there is a, something called as a request uh, idle callback. So now that if you have understood this one, right, I'll, I'll go back to my slides. <clears throat> so sometimes what really happens is, uh, as, as shown in this case, your JavaScript execution was just finished in like 22 microseconds here, right? like microseconds, okay? So now the rest of the slot is free here, okay? So where the browser is not doing much, 
So in that case, it would uh, uh, give you a callback to do your background processing, like uh, asynchronous tasks or any background fetches that you want to do, right? So there is a, something called as a request uh, idle callback. So what browser says is like, okay, now that I, I'm done generating a frame, let's assume that I, I will use the same reference over here. In the fetch phase itself is my, my work is over, uh, but then like these next cycles are available to me. So it gives something called as a request idle callback telling that what is your deadline? Okay, that so now assuming that these each block is assuming that one millisecond. So it is going to tell you that you have like four milliseconds left in your time so that you can execute whatever you want as a background and uh, you are and you need to kind of stick to that timeline. I mean deadline that is given to you. So this is quite uh, uh, a very handy API that uh, the JavaScript developers must use in order to leverage what browser is offering. Because I think typically the trend is like use the set timeout to call anything asynchronously, but these these are the impacts of uh, using this asynchronous uh, in an uncontrolled behavior. Okay. Is this like so, freeware yeah, or something like that? The, the monitoring software is it freeware? Yeah, yeah, this is free. I mean, like uh, you can fire up this in any any browser. You can open the dev tools and go to the performance panel here. Okay, and then you will see all of these ones here. So. Really? so Okay. Yeah, you can you can do this. Yeah. Wow. So um, can I ask you a question? Um, just on the sidelines. I mean, do you get? Um, I mean, you spend such a lot of time doing browser programming and all that. I do have a Java certificate and all that. Um, in terms of education, I don't know. Arvind Padmanabhan knows me from school days. I mean, we were out of touch for almost thirty years, right? Like twenty-five years, and now he's invited me, so we know each other from back school days. Um, do you get like bits and pieces of work on Java and all that? Um, like, like assignments and all that. Java, no. Not Java. Yeah. So, so, so. Not what, Java. What exactly do you do? in terms of programming? What do you do? Like. So I, I spend it? most of my time uh, in uh, uh, like C plus plus, Rust, Swift, uh, also JavaScript, Python, okay. all of these ones. So I have uh, but a C then... plus. I, I I do have some C plus plus knowledge. So, okay. Uh, and I I have a certificate. Well, somewhat. Yeah. On it. Uh, okay. I mean, if you do, if you do come across bits and pieces of work that you want to want to share or whatever type of work, then that would be great. Absolutely, yeah. So I would also uh, suggest uh, there is a Discord channel for CPP, uh, CPP India Con. Uh, so basically, that's quite an interesting one. Uh, a lot of uh, the C plus plus folks we ho uh, hang out there. So I would uh, like request anybody who who is interested in C plus plus. Feel free to join the Discord channel. Uh, it is CPP India Con. That is conference con. So okay. you can... should I note it down or take it from like Arvind or something like that? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll share that with Arvind. I'll share that with Arvind. Yeah. Okay, fine. Don't worry. Okay. All right. So uh, I just summarized in case the demo didn't go through well. Uh, I just wanted to kind of take a few screenshots and share uh, those things over here. So you can see that uh, this is where we are having the request animation frame, which is kind of nicely interspersed, whereas you can see a dense tree, which is really bad if you're running it on, on uh, let's say, uh, your laptops. Your battery is going to definitely drain uh, for no reason. And uh, yeah, a few of the things that I already mentioned, I already covered here. Uh, so like this is... With this uh, like request animation frame, how it is happening. So you will see a request animation time gets fired and then you will get a function call where I'm calling this update clock here. Uh, so you can see how much time I'm spending on each one of these ones here. And at the same time, you can see that this is getting generated at the beginning of this frame. So uh, like this frame will be painted in the next one, right? So uh, all of these phases like, uh, like Get executing JavaScript, doing few of the layouts because you are changing the, the text. Uh, then there is a pre-paint, paint, and commit. So these are, these are the final uh, stages. And this is when the actual paint really happens on the screen. Okay. So this is just more of a, a detailed overview if, if you missed it to uh, see during the live. And this is where I was talking about the set timeout issues. So set timeout, you can see that this is like your execution happens much earlier. And then all of these phases come in later. And this causes the issue of uh, uh, like ignoring these prior frames. Uh, you can see that this is my 16 milliseconds time frame. And here I'm generating this like three times, but only this one I'll be using it. Okay, so this is all, all uh, like redundant work that we can avoid. 
Yeah, and uh, I think I just wanted to show you one interesting looks very, thing. It looks very sophisticated to me. Looks very sophisticated, but you know, it's, it's, it looks like a very nice monitoring system, quite frankly. Yeah. Uh, um, and, and, and let me give the, my, my personal opinion is I think this sort of thing lacks. Well, let's put it that way in, in our sort of environment. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, like, in the first place, if you don't know where the problem is, how do you know how what you can do about it, right? Exactly. <laughs> you don't know where the problem is. Yeah, exactly. Wait, that's the problem. Half of the time, well, what the guys do, is, let, let me, so yeah, I don't intend to be critical because then that will sort of works tempish, you know? Uh, but, uh, I mean, as you said, you know, you fire another one and it works temporarily and you fire another one and it works temporarily. And then after that, you're at a dead end, isn't it? So then you have to get, you know, sort of get serious, right? Yeah. Right. And yeah, that's tooling, what I mean, hasn't Right. Exactly. Absolutely. I think the developer tooling is something that we tend to ignore because we are always uh, running behind the like end user experience, but developer experience also matters a lot. So that's where, uh, I mean, these tools would True. be really handy. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Okay, so no, this is this is this is a very enjoyable session, I must say, and you have so many years of experience, so wonderful interacting with you. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, has likewise. it been in the United States? Has it been in, in India or America, like in the United States? I have been uh, like in both places, uh, but right now I'm based out of Bangalore. Okay. So, uh, but then my my uh, current okay. company, the the browser company, is based out of New York. So I keep shuttling there. It's a startup. So. Oh, great. Yeah. All right, yeah, well, so so nice to get introduced to you because then, again, you know, this this is the problem. You know, the, we spoke about the three or four options, right? So the three or four options sort of uh, does quell the fear, you know, creating possibilities. Yeah. But then um, after that, it's sort of a dead end, you know. <laughs> so right, so yeah. like you have to get down to understanding what the where exactly the problem is and what is the I mean, what exactly is the nature of the problem, uh, the maximum. Uh, sort of uh, intensity, where does it lie, and where is the minimum intensity, and, and all that, yeah. you know, and categorize it and all that. So I guess your software does that. So that's pretty Absolutely. nice. Yeah. yeah. All right. So uh, I think, as I said, this just gave you an overview of uh, like what really happens behind the scenes. I have uh, purposefully avoided talking anything about the memory management, garbage collection, WebAssembly. Uh, me and Arvind, we were just talking about uh, how WebAssembly was used in prior sessions today and a lot more other V8 internals. Uh, so I think we, uh, this, I mean, I plan to cover this in, in like future, uh, obviously. And uh, before we go, I just wanted to show you a few of the interesting uh, bits. If I, if I have still a few more uh, like seconds here. Yeah, um, so now take a look at this one and uh, I hope you are able to see this, right? Yeah. Yeah, so this is, uh, an animation which is purely done in JavaScript, I mean, purely done in C, uh, CSS, and it has no JavaScript at all involved here. Okay, so if I if I do the same performance analysis on these ones, so when I reload the page and do the performance for this one, so you will see initial loading time, but then eventually uh, when it starts rendering this, uh, this content over here, uh, it uses no JavaScript at all because it is written purely in uh, CSS here. So you will see, that browser is nicely generating these frames here for, for each one of these ones. So there is no JavaScript here at all. I mean, these are basically your loading trees. And then once it is done, uh, you have absolute silence over here. So like uh, why I showed this thing to you, because it depends on like what kind of uh, animations or what kind of uh, functionality that your uh, website is going to employ. So please make use of these uh, uh, like nice venues that the browser is providing so that uh, we tend to do less work for JavaScript, and then uh, the end users are also happy uh, by not draining their batteries and uh, like keeping their systems cool. And, and this CSS uh, animation has to run somewhere, right? It still is running. This is, in running in the, this is running in the process, but what what really happens is, I mean, I, I can go into more details of these ones. So there is something called as a layers panel here. You can actually see. Okay, uh, sometimes it comes up, but then. When you go to this layers panel, so you will see this kind of layers getting generated here. Okay. So where each one of the things that you see over here uh, is generated as a separate uh, uh, separate layer. And what really happens is there is no paint that is needed here. Okay. So that means take, for example, take a look at this uh, second hand, which is kind of running really fast, right? 
So there are multiple ways in which you can program this. One is like running the JavaScript and like computing the angle each time and then like moving it across. But whereas what you can also do is you can move this into a layer and just transform that layer, right? I mean, because this is just a rotation that is happening. So CSS will give you a, a hint that I want to transform this layer. And that what really happens is because now there is no paint that is needed, the GPU actually captures your uh, texture and it keeps on just applying these uh, uh, like matrix for the transforms. So that is the reason you will see a smooth uh, transitions over here because this is purely happening <coughs> within the within the GPU here. So I can show you that as well here. Um, <coughs> so in the software, so go, it is very lightweight. It's it's very lightweight because this is all handled by the hardware acceleration. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> so if I if I if I see this one, so if you see that the the, the process is not doing much. I mean, as long as I'm as soon as I'm just start moving my mouse. Only then the actual work is happening here. Okay, so see here because I am moving it here, so this particular element needs to interact, and that's the reason this one is happening. Okay, and uh, you can also see the paint flashing. I'll just show you what is this. Okay, so the paint flashing means how many times the painting is happening on on this animation here. So you won't see anything, but let me go back to my my prior example and let me just run the same thing again uh, here, and you see the paint flashing. See this? Yeah. So now within your web page, it is showing you that uh, this particular region is getting painted again and again here. OK, so by looking at this thing, what you are saying is also that I can avoid this as long as I'm on the same day. I need not recompute this day here, right? So you can avoid this repaint here because this is also costly of operation here. I mean, of course, this is a very simple example, but you can imagine like if you're kind of repainting this, this is going to cost you here. And yeah, these these are again are like repainted every time here. So yeah, so there are many. And also, if I go to the frame rendering stats, you can see that this is uh, like running always at uh, 60 FPS because it's always doing something here. So this is expensive. So for this kind of an application where you have to show the time to the detail of a millisecond, that. Uh, the alternative you should request animation is that request the animation frame. Yes, yes, you should do the request animation frame because I'll show you the, in the code what I have done here is the the set timeout runs at zero. That means as soon as my my get call gets here, I am actually adding one call back here, okay, into the into the event pump. So this is like enormous amount of activity. I mean, of course, uh, this is fabricated example here just to show you the problems of using set timeout. So you could also do this 100 milliseconds here, like set time out at uh, run at 100. But again, uh, like that would depend like how browser sees it and then your scheduling will be a problem. But when you do the request animation frame, it is guaranteed that I uh, the browser will give you a time slot for you to run this. So if I go and refer this back, so this one is guaranteed, like you will get some slot within this with the request animation frame. Okay, so there are a few of the references that you can always refer to here. So this what the heck is an event loop anyway? It's a pretty nice talk. It's a quite old one, uh, like almost eight year old uh, for, for any JavaScript developer. This is really handy so that they can understand what really happens when you use set time out, when you use request animation frame, all of that one, because these are nothing but uh, an events in an event loop. Uh, this is the CSS animation and these are the other links. Um, so yeah. So one any other questions? Question. Yeah, one last yeah. question. You said sometimes the JIT compiler might do something, but it may not result in a better, much better performance. Yes. So as a developer, do I have control? Can I say don't apply no. JIT on this file? Something. No, like no, that. no, 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 no. That that is the reason I I made a disclaimer that uh, this is just to kind of give you an overview what really happens. Because imagine that you gave an instruction like okay, don't do the JIT. But what if if the your I mean you gave me a false positive over here, okay? Yeah. And then you have written a for loop which runs let's say for maybe let's say one million times. I mean hypothetically, okay? So and then if you have uh, told I mean imagine that the 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 loop counter comes uh, from your some of the server components and you thought initially when your program you wrote it it would probably run only for ten times. So you thought like probably don't do a JIT on this one. But imagine that somebody kind of 
uh, altered that number from 10 to 1 million. So immediately, if and if you have given the instruction to the browser that don't jit it, so then the browser is going to kind of crawl it here. So instead of that, that's the reason this is not actually exposed on any kind of directive, at least as of yet. So uh, I think you will have some control with the WebAssembly, uh, but again, that's a completely different topic, uh, not related to the question here. All right, so uh, I think with that, I think I'm done with my presentation and uh, I hope uh, uh, like you enjoyed this one, so. Yeah. Thank you, Vivek, it was a wonderful session, yeah. And uh, I have been a developer with JavaScript for many years now and I regularly use the dev tools, but okay. I always uh, get confused when I see the timeline, so. You explained it beautifully, so I think it's going to be very useful for me in my day-to-day -day work. Absolutely.